Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first I would like to start with introducing our special guest today that will join me here at the stage, and I would like to invite them uh, to, to join me here. First of all, uh, Minister Linas uh, Lin Linkevicius, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, starting from 2012. Minister Linkevicius has an extensive uh, career in public administration. He was the Minister of National Defense uh, in the 1990s of Lithuania, but also a permanent representative to NATO, to the, um, uh, to the Transatlantic Alliance uh, of Lithuania. Secondly, I would like to invite uh, our special guest from uh, Romania, Mr. Sebastian ne uh, Nekalescu, who is the Secretary of State for Strategic Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Romania. Let me, see, uh, let me just say that he is also an outstanding diplomat with a long-term uh, career in a number of multilateral uh, diplomatic organizations. He was a representative of uh, Romania in the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, but also at the OSCE. And last but not least, uh, I would like to uh, invite our Czech friend, uh, Minister Ivan uh, yes, Jastrop. Minister Jastrop, very nice to see you here. Uh, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, uh, who, well, if I would only start to uh, tell all the places that he has been posted, I would have to go from India, Sri Lanka, Serbia, Montenegro. Let me see, I have, I think, a list of 20 countries, Georgia, Armenia, so an extremely uh, accomplished uh, diplomat today, also dealing with the most important uh, security issues uh, from the side of the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of uh, the Czech Republic. So gentlemen, welcome. I'm very happy to, uh, we are all very happy to be hosting you here at the Warsaw Security Forum. And uh, our today's panel will be devoted to new, new uh, challenges to re regional security. What is the most effective uh, cooperation format uh, in the region? And especially in Central Europe, uh, and here uh, of what we call the Eastern flank, we have been debating and discussing how can we enhance the already ongoing uh, cooperation on the level of the EU and on the level of uh, NATO, uh, but make it more or regional. Let me start from asking each of you one simple question. If you could name one most pressing security issue for your country that you think would be significantly easier if we could cooperate together regionally, what would that security challenge be? Minister Linkevicius, please. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be back after one year. I'm good to see old friends. A very difficult question because it's never, never, you can, cannot single out something uh, even if it's one or two, uh, definitely when we're talking about security. When, we'll, when we speak about problematic countries, so we have not superpower but super problem, it's Russia. And basically I shouldn't focus just on that but definitely uh, nowadays we have to pay more attention, spend more time in analyzing uh, what's going on. And frankly speaking, the effect is very lamentable. So I shouldn't say that it's just for Lithuania or for, for our regional countries. It's for whole whole international community, basically. It's even for peace system in the world, if you I may say so. Uh, it undermines a lot of principles and values what we are standing for. So this is definitely something that deserves our attention and also actions, actions, at least reaction and uh, very clear stance. Thank you very much. Minister, please. Thank you very much. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I would say uh, the most pressing uh, security concerns that we have is to the east and to the south. But naturally, from a Romanian point of view, is the developments that we have witnessed in the east. Basically, a, the lack of predictability, the lack of trust, the uh, violation of international law, coupled with also military buildup, it's indeed increasing the, the concerns that we have and uh, makes you wonder what's next. Thank you. We'll go back, come back to that question, what's next. Please, Minister. Thank you. Na początku chciałbym podziękować naszym polskim przyjaciołom za organizację do świetnej konferencji dzisiejszej. And now I will switch to English. Uh, well, uh, there's a lot of insecurity around us. There is actually an arc 
of insecurity and instability along NATO's periphery uh, and beyond. Uh, the, the, the alliance is facing a range of security challenges, threats that originate both in the east as well as in the south. Uh, it was already mentioned here in the beginning. Uh, we face uh, 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 threats from states and non-state act uh, actors. We face threats uh, and challenges from military forces as well as uh, from terrorists. We face uh, challenges uh, from uh, cyber criminals, uh, sometimes sponsored by state actors. Uh, there, is, there is a very wide range of challenges we are facing today. Uh, at the NATO uh, Warsaw Summit in July, we agreed that uh, this is, uh, uh, what, what we face is a, a really uh, unprecedented spectrum of risks. And we cannot, uh, on my opinion, we cannot focus only on one, one specific, and exclude others. Uh, we have to uh, deal with all those challenges simultaneously. And uh, this is the only way how we can really defend uh, our values, our alliance, our countries, our friendship. Thank you very much. So looking at those challenges you, you have mentioned, and I think we see, of course, that for all of us, uh, these challenges are more and more common. Uh, do you think there's a special role for regional cooperation in facing these challenges? And do you have any positive examples where you could say, listen, we cooperated with our neighbors on this specific initiative, and it was a particular su success. So this kind of enhanced regional cooperation. Uh, do you have any examples? Minister Linkevichos. There are many examples in the recent history, and also nowadays, and we're exploring all these formats very, I would say, efficiently. Uh, I can mention from our Baltic perspective, uh, early 90s, when we used the Baltic operation, uh, it was very deep, very, 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 very strong. Also, uh, later it went on towards Nordic uh, direction, and we have Nordic, so to say, five, five plus three, as we were talking about, and uh, slowly, slowly it growed uh, into uh, Nordic Baltic eight. Uh, naturally, so we became Nordic Baltic family, and that was exactly for consolidation, not for for dividing anything. It was uh, this format, and still it is, uh, as a bridge between European Union and NATO. I would say because some countries, some members of both organizations, some just of one, and we are comparing notes, also defining and uh, clarifying our priorities. So this is about groupings. Also, Nordic uh, Baltic uh, meets uh, regularly Visegrad countries, let me mention. It was also very useful, everyone very happy, for the same reasons. It's important uh, to have this consolidation effort, right? Also, I would say it's not so important setting, particular setting or a number of countries or geographical, uh, so to say, uh, maybe some borders. Uh, it's, it's important to, to consolidate values. Today is important to act or to react on time, not too late, to do not too little, but, but sufficiently. Uh, inter, uh, so to say, influence the situation uh, when, when we are capable to do something, not to wait until uh, dark clouds will come up and you know, then too late to do something or too costly or even not possible. Uh, what we unfortunately sometimes uh, facing the situation like that. So I believe uh, let's speak about format or setting of values. Let's consolidate and defend uh, in reality, in real, real time, in, in, real, in real situation. Now we really have a lot of challenges and it was mentioned uh, and everything at the same time, migration, terrorism, let me mention also as a challenge Brexit, uh, right? Or uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine or actions in Syria, everything at the same time. Are we reacting on time? Uh, I'm not so sure. Are we capable to intervene or to make some difference? At least, uh, I'm not so sure because we see the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the question. So, and frankly, you know, uh, morally and uh, practically speaking, uh, look, when we uh, meetings, endless, endless meetings, summits, handshakes, uh, uh, family photos, uh, kind of discussions, at the same time when people being killed in Aleppo, right? Mm -hmm. uh, every time. So what they should think about, uh, about civilization 21st century. 
why, why is this happening? Are we really capable to do something at least? Or we really just can meet and talk and condemn and to say how we are concerned or how we are deeply concerned. We are very gifted to make all these statements. Same it was in, in Ukraine. Ukraine was exactly the same. In 21st century, somebody tries to redraw European borders. 21st century. Uh, is it not alarming? But it's not the first time. It was in Georgia in 2008. It was a war in Georgia. Uh, it was like, like wake-up call, which was not sufficient to wake up, as usually. These are the questions, not formats. Not formats, but are we capable, when we are together, to form, so to say, position uh, to, to, to come up when it is important to, to do that? And, to, and sometimes, sometimes we are not, uh, answer, answer is unfortunately ne negative. Thank you. I, I think we'll get back to many of those questions, especially regarding values. But if I can also uh, hear from uh, the Romanian and the Czech side some examples of actually successful regional cooperation, I imagine, around the Black Sea. Um, thank you. Um, yes, you can hear and I can talk for hours on that, but I will not. I'll just simply limit to what I think is uh, of interest of today's discussion. Um, you see, we have seen that you know, NATO has had a very swift and comprehensive reaction to what we have witnessed uh, as developments in the East. And um, in, 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 we wanted also to increase the synergies in our region to uh, make sure that we implement the decision we have taken together in, in Wales and in Warsaw. And for that particular reason, Romania, together with Poland actually, we developed a platform for consultations among the uh, uh, and that's a recent initiative, um, among the uh, allies belonging to the eastern flank, which they met on November 2015 in Romania and discussed about it and adopted uh, a, a, a statement, a common statement, statement which has been quite reflective, very well reflected in the Warsaw Summit communique. So here it is, one concrete action that we have took together with our Polish colleagues and the countries in, in, in the flank uh, in order to ensure that the uh, decisions that we have taken and we were about to take at that point in the Warsaw Summit are implemented rightly. And we can develop more on that. And I think this format that we call it, for Booker's format, has a future uh, as a platform of consultations. Again, I mean, nothing is institutional. We're not aiming anything else. We simply want to make sure that we can coordinate ourselves to implement better and efficiently the decision we have taken in the NATO context. Um, at the same time, we have developed for uh, three, four years now, again, another initiative as a, a platform of consultations, again, together with our Polish colleagues, and that's uh, uh, important to mention, our trilateral cooperation and consultation format at the minister's level with the uh, Poland, Romania, and Turkey, which I think is also relevant and important. We have been working in, in, in at this format for quite some time and developed it at the level of state secretary, but yet this year, we had already two meetings of this trilateral, one in Warsaw and one in, uh, in Ankara. So look, there are options and ideas. Obviously, regional cooperation is important, is natural, and from our standpoint, helps the larger formats that you mentioned, implementing the decisions and keep us united. Thank you very much. Minister? Thank you. Um, well, locally focused security and defense uh, cooperation formats, they equally help uh, uh, to improve, to strengthen uh, transatlantic cooperation as such. Uh, for us, uh, let me uh, mention just a few of those uh, uh, which we see as very important. Uh, uh, Visegrad Group, Bucharest Format, or Framework Nations Concept. Uh, in Visegrad, uh, we have reached a uh, quite high level of cooperation in defense. Uh, let me name just uh, establishment of uh, the, the, the special body uh, formed by uh, our state secretaries or political directors in the uh, defense ministries, uh, the common planning, um, and so on. However, uh, it is my uh, deep conviction that uh, the transatlantic relationship is the key for security of Europe. Uh, let me remind you about uh, Article 3 of the North Atlantic Treaty, uh, uh, which includes the obligation of uh, uh, allies to maintain and develop uh, uh, 
their individual as well as uh, collective capacity in defense. Uh, I am convinced that uh, self-help and uh, mutual aid uh, on a regional level as well within the alliance uh, uh, as a whole will uh, allow us to achieve uh, transatlantic objectives and uh, collective defense goals much more effectively. Uh, this is also why we encourage uh, each other and ourselves as well uh, to uh, fulfill the obligations uh, which uh, we all have in the alliance. Uh, it means to reach 2% uh, of GDP uh, 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 dedicated to defense and 20% uh, on investment. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, problems uh, uh, connected uh, with uh, this obligation. Uh, I will give an uh, example of my country. Uh, our GDP growth is uh, quite good, which our finance minister and the population welcomes, of course. But it makes uh, our task to reach 2% uh, of GDP on defense much more problematic and difficult. Because in, in real terms, money-wise, of course, the, our, our defense budget is increasing considerably. But in percentage-wise, of course, it is not uh, uh, growing so much. And the second uh, uh, problem, which uh, in this respect I'd like to mention, it is the effectiveness, how we spend this money. Of course, it's, it's nice to have a lot of money on procurement, but uh, the quality of procurement is another case, and we have to take it into consideration. We have to, 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 to remember that effectiveness of military uh, procurement and of use of money we have on defense must be also, always kept on the first place. Thank you very much. Minister, you would like to add something to this? No, I'd like, like just to continue because really a very good point. It's not sufficient to talk about 2% or whatever percent of GDP. Output efficiency is not less important. I see General Breedlove, <laughs> who knows quite well that. And it's important how we are spending, how we are spending for joint capabilities, I would say. And now again, I hear voices which were some time ago, and uh, these voices were silenced. Uh, voices to have, again, something like European Army, for instance. Let me speak in Warsaw about that, because there was some initiative coming from Visegrad countries, and then we tried to clarify what that means. If we're talking about more cooperation, more, more efficiency, that's okay. But we're talking about duplication or competition, that's very bad. And I remember it was time, how many years ago, when there was idea to create uh, European military HQ at headquarters in Tervuren which is not so far from NATO HQ, which is really quite weird situation. And then it was realized it's not so important. It was a competition between two trends, I would say. As, as Defense Minister, I remember we're discussing title of uh, format of, again, format of cooperation of Defense Ministers. And there were two groups. One group was saying that we should create European procurement agency. Another group was saying European capabilities agency. Uh, we belong to that latter. And uh, we, we really need to develop capabilities in order to add value to what is going on already in NATO, for instance. Uh, and it was a compromise, and we called it European Defense Engines Agency, which is, exists, exists now. So I, I hear the, the same voices now again, to, to fight, to compete, maybe given the situation that Brits leaving European Union, but I hope and I believe Brits not leaving Europe. Not, not leaving European thinking, not le leaving European cooperation, and definitely they will not leave European security issues. So we have to keep uh, it steady and go uh, ahead with, with the aiming to create more capabilities which could be mutually compatible. And, and really that has to do with the money, by the way, at the end of the day. It's, it's respect to the taxpayers' money. If we are spending some, especially for the small, small countries, if we are spending some resources to create some capabilities and then autonomously to, to create something else for another organization, it's really not wise. It's even, even irresponsible, I would say. Uh, now in European Union we have battle groups, uh, but never used in practice, which is also a signal. So it's not about that, it's about willingness, about motivation, about uh, organization of what we are doing. So uh, output efficiency, not less important than percentage of GDP, and that could be done only in coordination, in, in, in compatibility, not in competition 
or duplication of our efforts. Very important to know that. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, please. Yes, I just wanted to comment on that. I fully agree with what has been said so far. On the other hand, I think uh, making the 2% threshold possible, it's also a sign of willingness and political commitment. And I think uh, in that respect, it is important to continue along this path. For instance, Romania has been quite um, uh, firmly uh, going to that, uh, achieving 2% next year. And uh, we have an internal political consensus to keep it for some time. And I'm, I'm thinking, and I hope all allies at one point will understand the importance of um, not only spending efficiently, which I fully agree, but also attaining 2%, which is, again, a sign of commitment that we all look to. Thank you. Mr. Yastrump, you wanted to add something to also. Yes, I, I'd like to continue what Minister actually started with. Uh, he mentioned uh, a very broadly discussed issue of European uh, defense. Uh, well, the backbone for our security today is NATO, and it must remain so. We cannot develop parallel structures. It would be costly, it would be ineffective, it would be wrong. If the uh, idea of European uh, defense means strengthening of the European leg of NATO, then I'm sure uh, it will be the right way how to proceed. If we are talking about duplications, about building new structures, uh, about uh, new, new, new uh, uh, headquarters and so on, then we will just spend money unwisely. Thank you very much. Before I give the floor to the audience, because it's very important for us actually to have the questions and the discussion with the audience, let me ask you one final question. And uh, it might stir up a bit of the discussion. The question of values and solidarity, Mr. Linkevicius, so you started this and talking about values. We often create those formats and we focus too little on values, much more on, on the practicalities of that cooperation. And uh, especially we have seen in the last uh, few years that uh, some of our good friends and neighbors were more worried that we're focused more on pragmatical cooperation and we put too little stress on what, what unites us as, as a community uh, of values. What is your take on this? My take is not scientific, but very practical, and uh, that's exactly what we're talking these days. I came here to, to Warsaw from Hague. I spent whole day yesterday in Hague discussing with members of parliament association agreement with Ukraine. And uh, really open, very frank discussion. That was also about values. That was also about something what is really very important. It's also about democracy. And I talked to members of parliament. Uh, I said, look, it's interesting. Uh, referendum is always direct participation of people in decision-making process. But we have to respect these people, informing them what we're doing about, what we're discussing, what, what we're deciding, frankly. And finally, uh, I told uh, to members of parliament in the Netherlands that if you're taking as a country as a hostage, solving your own problems, it's not democracy. It's something else. So if you're if you're trying to, to present this, this issue as, as a solution, it's not a solution, it's a complication of matters. And I also told what President Yanukovych didn't do, uh, not signing uh, this uh, association agreement a few years ago. It's uh, weird, but it would be done by Dutch government. I said, it's not possible. Uh, it's really not possible, we have to find a solution. It's not, not, about, not only about free trade, it's not only about money, which is also very important because the growth of trade uh, is enormous during these days when provisional application of a session agreement uh, taking place. It's also put values about political signal, support to the country which fights in the war. Uh, they, one of the few, or maybe the only capital in Europe where people were dying with the European Union flags uh, in the hands. Uh, I do not have any other precedent. And we're looking at that little soccer game, you know, who will win, who will, who will, so to say, deliver, and saying, no, no, you are not ready. Of course they're not ready. Of course they have a lot of problems, corruption, uh, to name it. But nevertheless, uh, they're doing enormous progress during these years. And to be uh, impartial, it's not the right solution. It's also about values. So uh, I can provide many examples of that, and sometimes we do not think that we, we are making right statements, we, but it should be applicable uh, in the real time, uh, and, and here and now, when we speak. Then, then they have some value. 
If not, we are compromising these statements and even our positions if we are not acting accordingly. So that's very important to remember. Gentlemen, we are as strong as we are united, but we are also as, we are as strong as we believe in something and not are against something. Do you see this also in the aspect of solidarity of the of the both EU and, and NATO communities uh, that that may actually come back and haunt us? Interesting question. Um, I would say one of the most important outcome of the NATO summit in Warsaw this year was solidarity. And this has been important throughout the years. For, what, for us, at least, it was the magnet that drew us into NATO in the first place, the values. And we will stay and contribute actively towards that because simply we believe in that. So the values are the core. Our regional cooperation that I have envisaged, especially the uh, Allies' cooperation in the eastern flank, are also based on values so, uh, that unite us. This is basically, from our stand of view, the core of the whole thing today. And today, values are more than ever important. That's why solidarity and transatlantic link, for us at least at this point, remain one of the most important you know, values that we uh, feel drawn to it, of course, together with the other ones related to democracy, rule of law, and everything else. Thank you. Minister Yastrop. Uh, Europe is a very small part of this world. If you look at the map of, of, of the world, uh, Europe is really small dot. Uh, some politologists even speak about uh, European Peninsula, uh, uh, pointing to the fact that uh, Europe is, is, is not big. Uh, what we are unique, uh, uh, of is uh, that we share uh, uh, the same values. At least I hope that Europe still shares uh, its, uh, uh, its values uh, together with uh, our friends overseas. Uh, and we have to defend those values. They uh, uh, developed gradually, historically, and uh, uh, this is, this is uh, the greatest value we have. We have to we have to uh, defend it uh, in the best possible way. Uh, well, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, being united for something, not against something. Uh, I think that uh, this is the same uh, 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 coin, only two sides. If we are defending our values, of course we cannot be silent. These are the values we don't share, and we have to defend uh, our values against values of those uh, which uh, differ uh, from us. And we have to be very, very decisive in this. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a chance to ask a question or a comment. Yes, please. I think uh, Daniel Fried. Just wait a moment, the microphone is coming. I don't see the microphone coming. It is, I'm sorry, it's running from the other side of the room. Yeah. Um, Pani Director. Pani Director, I am in agreement with your, the basis of your question about common values, and as you might expect, I agree with what I heard from the panel. Um, the way I would put it is that the European miracle is like good health, missed only when it is gone, um, to paraphrase Polish poetry. Um, the political impulse which has brought us so far, which gave us first a united Western Europe and then a united Europe after 1989 and 1991, is in danger of being taken for granted and challenged by nativist forces, um, how can I put it delicately, on both sides of the Atlantic and throughout Europe. Liberal forces in the broadest sense, not a partisan sense, um, have a challenge. And I'll say more about this in the panel tomorrow, 
but there are anti-liberal forces, and I would say that it is a mistake to think Russia is devoid of an ideology. I think it has one, and it is profoundly anti-liberal. So that, that political challenge underlies much of what we do. The Warsaw Summit decisions, I think, did not get enough attention in my country, partly because we were consumed with Brexit. That was a major achievement. But we have our challenges, and underlying the security issues is that political challenge, and I think a need to recall what it is we set out to achieve after 1989 both for our own countries individually and for a larger, um, a larger European community. Um, final point, I do appreciate the arguments Premier Morawiecki made, if I understood them correctly, about economic growth versus austerity. I'm putting it more bluntly than he did, but if I understood him correctly, that was a point he was making, and that is also worthy because it may be that the politics of extreme austerity after the 2007-2008 uh, financial downturn has fueled the anti-liberal, anti-European, and really anti-Western politics, which we hear rumblings about in all of our countries. So you've outlined in the first session of this conference, I think, the crucial themes. So thank you, and this is, um, it's good to be here and see um, old friends. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you, Ambassador Fried. We have another uh, question comment on the other side of the room, and I see also in the back there as well. So we'll take uh, two more, and then we'll allow you to uh, respond to these. Um, I just wanted to bring up... You and please also introduce yourself. Hi, Zaid Harun. Uh, just have a couple of comments based on what was picked up. One was said that uh, the two, one of some of the key concerns is immigration and terrorism which is one of the factors. Then it was brought up by that, uh, things that might come back to haunt. So just wanted to get an opinion or a comment on some of the things that might be the due course of this from previously, like for example, uh, the Afghanistan war, and that country is still in a mess now, 79 you know, against the Soviets. Then the Iraq war, which is the controversial aspect. And, when you talk about immigrant, immigrants coming in, I mean, these are a lot of immigrants coming in from these countries like Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria, which seems to be a little of a turf for going on. Uh, just wanted to get some comments on that, that when you talk about something coming back to haunt, do you think these could be based on the previous decisions that might have taken or not executed as they might have been to avoid this now? Thank you very much. And one last question, I think, was uh, somewhere in the, uh, that direction, a gentleman. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Komentar Wysław I am the legal advisor to the NATO Joint Force Training Center in, uh, in Bydgos, Poland, in fact. So thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. Secondly, I would like to make two comments, one on the regional security arrangements in the military terms, and I would like to address the two key uh, efforts made by the Alliance to reinforce the eastern and the southern flank. And the examples include, for instance, the creation of the multinational division Southeast, in Romania, which is a perfect example of regionalized military cooperation to address the southern flank challenges. Uh, the other comment that I wanted to make uh, refers to the NATO-EU cooperation, especially in, in, in the uh, defense area. I, I don't think on either on neither of the sides there is an intent to duplicate dupli duplicate efforts. I'm sorry. Uh, on the other, uh, to the contrary, I think mutual support, mutual cooperation as uh, reassessed, re re reaffirmed in, in the joint declaration is the key. And there's been a long-standing practice in this regard uh, to name, for instance, uh, Altia operation led by the EU and, and K4 uh, uh, by NATO, um, uh, ISAF mission in Afghanistan and UPOL mission in Afghanistan, Operation Atalanta, in the Horn of Africa and NATO's Operation Ocean Shield, you name it. There's been plenty of examples, and I'm glad that the cooperation is getting more and more institutionalized 
not only in terms of the uh, joint declaration, but the perfect example is the uh, memorandum of understanding on cybersecurity uh, signed in February this year between NSERC and CERT EU. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we ha we open up uh, in the last 15 minutes discussions to two big uh, broad topics. On the one side, the question uh, that Ambassador Fried, I think, uh, opened up, and we will continue after the break in a big panel devoted to the future of the liberal order. But the quest question of these populist forces that we have within our societies, uh, which actually are definitely weakening our resolve, our solidarity, our ability to cooperate with each other, they uh, undermine trust uh, to, towards each other because we promise each other something and then our populations say no and we need to say we're sorry but we can't really continue doing that even if we know that is the right thing to do and even we have those commitments. So how worried are you actually about what is going on within our societies uh, today? I don't want you to be specific about your countries. Uh, I don't want to pinpoint you on specific things but, but when you look at this, how big of a challenge is, is, is it not only for regional cooperation, but really for the transatlantic alliance and the European Union. Minister Linkevicius. Well, it's applicable to all formats and everything what we're doing, uh, as I said, to react in time, not too late and not too little. And uh, very important to coordinate our efforts uh, because nothing is pumping up uh, like from nowhere, this populism or anti-liberalism. Uh, it's it's uh, taking place, it's, vacuum cannot be, so to say, empty. It's immediately filled. If we, lack of leadership, lack of, so to say, proactive stance, uh, lack of proactive agenda, uh, sometimes we're really reacting to what's, what's happening in everywhere, not only security, let's say, uh, maybe it's not very popular <laughs> to talk, but I have to say that I'm a supporter of TTIP, for instance, right? We all see how it's difficult. Now we're stuck with the free trade agreement with Canada, I mean, European Union. Even that is stuck, so probably will be difficulties with TTIP, but we have to go ahead. And frankly, this is why, because we also were quite passive. You remember there were million signatures collected against. And if you ask those people who signed, they even don't know what they're doing because uh, nobody explained what this is, it is about. Nobody understood that because of this treaty we can uh, create new jobs. We can really boost our economies from both sides of Atlantic and that will be a big boost to the world, frankly speaking. We even can set new rules of trade in the world, which is also important to do. But nobody speaking about that, but having some prejudice uh, and, and really waiting until, as I said, dark clouds will come up and then we're trying to defend, which is too costly, sometimes even not possible. In security, the same. In politics, the same. It was overlooked, uh, migration crisis, right? Uh, definitely, you can say whatever you want, but this is really came, I shouldn't say totally unexpected, but it was like unexpected, right? But he, here we have to react now to this situation which is already happening. So uh, everything is possible if we really pull together all resources, uh, manpower, thinking, and those who like-minded politically coming together. And it's good. Przyjemne pana widać, panie ambasadorze. Państwo chyba wiedzą, że pan ambasador mówi bardzo dobrze po polsku też, Dan Fried. Evident Polish language. <laughs> and, and frankly, uh, old, old colleague of mine, and we, we really <laughs> discussed uh, many times these issues. And he is responsible for the sanctions, for instance. It's not a big secret, right? And we're coordinating, coordinating these issues with, with the European Union. When we are capable to do something together, it works. If not, it's not working. So very good example. Uh, so this vacuum or, or something, <laughs> it's not coming out of our uh, really precise and good cooperation, it's, it's a bad. So in every corner, every concrete uh, matter, we can find uh, something like example, what could happen or could not happen. So uh, all these populists, all these, so to say, one day, uh, uh, power, which is which is not 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 very very sustainable, but nevertheless making some effect in our national countries, in our politics, in European politics, uh, will be less less important. It will be uh, more more proactive, more forward leaning, uh, not uh, not not just wait and see. And uh, that would be my maybe first uh, at first glance uh, reaction. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I just want to point out two issues. First. I'm also more optimistic. I think we have a lot of uh, achievements that we can climb on. We can work on the, the summit in Warsaw, 
the, the NATO EU cooperation and perspectives, uh, transatlantic, uh, the, the, the transatlantic link, our, our, our devotion and friendship and coordination with our US partners. There are a lot of things that we can work on and build from that in a positive way. So I think it's just a, a momentary lapse at this point that we see this fragmentation, but I'm really optimist that we can go over. And I just want to, uh, one comment that has been uh, to an um, intervention about the multinational brigade that is in Romania, I felt compelled to say something about it. It's not only a, a regional um, uh, 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 initiative, it's basically agreed in NATO. So basically the multinational brigade that is going to be uh, uh, operating in Romania with the support well, Polish and other allies and Bulgarians. Um, it's an it's an initiative that's been decided in, in NATO and it's part of the uh, uh, tailored forward presence, uh, which together with the enhanced forward presence in the northeast, in the north part of the eastern flank, together formed the decision that we took in NATO to uh, uh, install the forward presence on the eastern flank. So I would say multinational brigade in Romania, it's more than the regional cooperation, it's part of the NATO decisions and allied decisions to uh, uh, increase the security of, of eastern allies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ambassador Free, for raising uh, liberal or anti-liberal uh, issue and uh, I will definitely follow the further discussion on this uh, topic uh, later on. Uh, it's, it's extremely important, yes. Uh, we face uh, uh, the, the race of uh, populism, anti-liberal thoughts uh, uh, in many countries. And uh, uh, I think they are, they are uh, actually uh, two sources of them. One is external. The external one uh, is uh, uh, quite powerful. We have to be able to face it uh, and uh, to, to, to defend against it. Uh, but uh, it wouldn't be successful if there were not uh, internal uh, reasons for uh, such a growth of populism in the countries uh, uh, which uh, actually uh, we live in. Uh, I, I was thinking uh, uh, about the reasons uh, uh, for a while and uh, I think that uh, people suddenly uh, realized that uh, uh, the end of history didn't materialize what they hoped for. Uh, that uh, the, the problems of the world continue in, in different form but uh, the world is uh, not uh, the paradise uh, suddenly and that uh, we have to deal with uh, troubles uh, which come along. And uh, uh, this situation was, uh, was used by uh, political forces which seek uh, uh, power, which seek influence, and uh, these forces are our domestic forces. Uh, which, which uh, requires from, from the political representation the clear defense of democracy inside our countries and uh, in, in the, the structures, international structures which we form. Um, of course, there is no need for panic. I, I don't think that uh, uh, we are on the edge uh, or that we face a really critical situation. However, we have to be aware of that and we have to, to fight against uh, all forms uh, uh, of populism domestically. And, of course, we have to uh, 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 face the challenges and, and defend it against challenges which come from outside, which support, actually, those domestic anti-liberal forces which, which we have. Thank you very much. And I think to wrap up, we had before uh, a, um, a defense industry event and we had General Sheriff who was saying he doesn't have a magic ball, you know, to say what, what the future is. But I would really like to pick your mind and find out uh, in a random, you know, uh, it doesn't have to, we don't have to start with Minister Linkevitius, but I would really like to find out how do you see regional cooperation, including the European Union, in 10 years? Will we become stronger? 
I know because we we have been all very anxious and very worried in the last few years. But when you think about it, with the whole experience that you have, diplomatic experience, professional experience, personal experience, uh, what do you tell your kids? And what world will they be living in? Please. Very shortly. Less selfish we will be, the better European Union we will get. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Zinkevichus? Yeah, maybe longer, but... <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, we already agreed that the key security format, format is NATO. So we have to strengthen this organization, make sure that they're reacting on time, doing what they're supposed to do, and that would be a very important factor uh, for stability, not only in our region, but also in the world. Uh, also, European Union, very important. Now, experiencing stress tests, frankly, so we have to go out of that stronger, but it's not a given, it's not a given. But very important, uh, having said this, uh, it also has to do with what I said, uh, current uh, security architecture in Europe. Uh, I would like to see it survived, because there are efforts to destroy, to rebuild, to start from scratch. I believe it's wrong, it shouldn't happen. I know, I know that not, not everyone happy with current security architecture, so to say. But we shouldn't, uh, we should stop this uh, process of destruction uh, because, uh, well, if somebody thinks that we have to rebuild and to include, uh, engage everyone regardless, again, values and principles and commitments, forgetting what was so far, it's, it's wrong. We cannot, uh, so see, if somebody violates uh, traffic lights, re removing the lights, it's not the solution. There will be no violations, definitely, but it's not a solution. So we have to stay where we are, to, to build, to strengthen, and that's important for, as, how many years you said? 10 years, right? So that at least for the 10 years will be a very important task to strengthen existing security architecture and uh, not to give up. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I just simply want to disappoint you. I don't uh, tell my kids about the regional cooperation in 10 years. I don't speak with them on that theme. But maybe you should. But maybe I should, yeah. But nevertheless, the idea is this regional cooperation will exist in 10 years as long as it serves the bigger scope, which is consolidating NATO and the EU. And that's exactly, uh, I also want to align myself with what Mr. Linkevich said about the security architecture, which I believe is absolutely true. We have an acquis, we have an engagement commitment, we have a strong web of, of, of treaties and, and, and provisions that need to be respected in the first place, and then we can think of renewing them. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a great round of applause to our speakers. <laughs>